My name is Dr. Scott Crawford, and I would like to welcome you to today's Grand Rounds presentation hosted by the Southwest Center for Pediatric Environmental Health. The Southwest Center for Pediatric Environmental Health is one of 10 pediatric environmental health specialty units, also known as PESUs, in the U.S. The purpose of the PESU program is to serve as a leading national source of medical information and consultative advice on environmental conditions that influence human health throughout reproduction and pediatric development. To serve part of our mission, we offer this Grand Round series once a month on the third Thursday of every month. We're grateful that you have joined us today to hear Dr. Stephanie Weiss speak on glucagon-like peptide GLP-1 receptor agonists to treat addiction. Before we move forward, I want to make sure that everybody is aware of a few housekeeping items. So during the event, um, as you log in, sharing your video is not an option during this WebEx event, and you will be muted by default upon joining and will not be able to unmute yourself. If you have a question or to be able to speak, you'll need to type your question into the chat or Q&A panel, and um, we will address those questions. Or if you wish to be unmuted uh, to ask a more detailed question, we can do that as well. We'd like to thank all of our partners at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. Without these organizations, the work of the PESU would not exist. We would like to thank Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center El Paso CME Department for making, making both CME and CNE credits available for the Grand Round Series. Each registrant must log in with their own registration ID, which will be used to track their login. This will allow us to provide these continuing education credits and we ask that if you are requesting credit that you stay on the call for the entire presentation. All registered participants who are seeking CME and CNE credits must request their credits after they have completed the post test and survey for that grand rounds presentation and that information will be emailed out. So, in order to help with that check in. Um, this QR code will take you to the CME check in um, and the web link that it will direct you to is at the bottom and we'll include that in the chat in just a few moments. But I'll wait here just a moment while people try to um, be able to log in. But again, I will include that in the chat in just a moment. So our next Grand Rounds series uh, will be on July 18th and discuss environmental public health tracking, data explorer and related health projects. And this will be with Alexis Williams and Kate Friedman. And we hope that you can join us next month as well. QR code here will help you register for the Grand Round series. We are excited to be able to continue providing some additional training on pesticide use and its health effects on migrant farm workers and their families along the US-Mexico border as one of the particular interests for the PESU and looking at childhood cancer and environmental exposures as another project um, that is a focus of the PESU. But without further ado, we'd like um, to have you help us in welcoming our presenter today. So uh, the Southwest Center for Pediatric and Environmental Health is very pleased to be joined by Dr. Stephanie Weiss. Dr. Uh, Weiss is the staff clinician serving the Translational Addiction Medicine Branch of the National Institute on Drug Abuse Intramural Research Program. After earning a PhD in pharmaceutical chemistry, from the University of South Florida, Dr. Weiss received her medical degree from Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine in 2011. She practiced as an emergency physician in Florida before completing fellowship in addiction medicine and medical toxicology, a subspecialty that cares for patients with poisonings, environmental exposures, and overdoses. She also participated in Boston University's Research in Addiction Medicine Scholars Program, which fosters the development of addiction physician scientists. Dr. Weiss assumed responsibility for providing optimal, safe, and ethical care to study participants and clinical support toward the TAMB mission of conducting inpatient and outpatient proof of concept human laboratory studies. Her research interests include kratom toxicology, medication misuse, and improving interpretation of urine drug testing. Again, we are very fortunate to have her with us today. And on behalf of the Southwest Center for Pediatric Environmental Health, we would like to offer her a warm welcome. So let me transition the uh, presenter role over to you and we'll get started. Okay. 
So I should go ahead and try to share. Yes, should work now. Okay. All right, so hopefully you guys are are seeing my my presentation is is the is it in presentation? Everything looks good. Go ahead. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. And I am actually not going to be talking about any of those things in, in Scott's very nice introduction here. I am going to be talking to you about something completely different, which is one of the kind of hot areas in, in addiction medicine right now, and uh, which is nice, segues very nicely actually with everything, which segues nicely with toxicology, segues nicely also uh, with chemistry and it segues nicely with with pediatrics as uh, which the pediatric evidence will be very short since there's not much of, about it. Um, I'm going to just go through these are your PSU slides here. I don't have any conflicts of interest. I do want to say, though, that the drug that we're using for our trial, which is semaglutide, I will be talking about the brand names and the reason for that will become clear when I get to that point. And then I do want to remind everybody that this use of semaglutide and other GLP-1 receptor agonists for treating addictive disorders is off label, so not approved by the FDA. And then these are the learning objectives. I'm going to be talking about the, the toxicology. I'm going to be talking about preclinical evidence of why we think these medications could be repurposed and used for addiction. And then also talk about the ongoing clinical trials. And uh, since this is a tox oriented group, talk about the some of the adverse events that that people may run across, particularly uh, revolving around these agents. So, many of you may have heard of semaglutide and other GLP-1 receptor agonists, and there's been a lot of info uh, on the news and, and, and social media and so forth. And so, I like this quote from, which comes from NPR, where the, the speaker was talking about the, the similar kind of scenario that happened several decades ago now with Viagra, which, as she points out, Viagra was... Um, originally meant to treat blood pressure and, oh, surprise, it turns out to be helpful for erectile dysfunction. And so it, be, it actually became popular for that reason. And similarly then, Ozempic, which is one of the brand names for semaglutide, was initially approved as a diabetes medication and then became popular because it turned out to also have use for weight loss in obesity. And then several celebrities, as well as so-called influencers on social media have been have either admitted to, to using drugs like semaglutide. And I don't think Oprah ever actually came out and said which of the GLP-1 receptor agonists she was on. She was on the board for Ozempic though. So um, people often assume that it was Ozempic, but you can actually see a before and after picture here from when, when she was taking some semaglutide or, or a different receptor agonist, whichever one she was taking. That's actually not though um, the reason we that we're doing these studies, and I will explain that in a minute. But part of why, I, uh, before I do that, I want to take a step back and talk about the like, why do we even care? Why is this even becoming such a big deal? And this shows uh, this graph shows from uh, from the CDC data um, what has been happening over time as. Uh, how the obesity epidemic, and these are just for obesity, not for overweight, right? So we're talking about a BMI of 30 or greater. And you can see over the course of the last several decades, we now have over 40% of adults uh, and also 20% of children under age 20, children and adolescents under age 20. So this is, again, just the obesity, not talking about overweight. So because of the fact that obesity and overweight are both increasing so much in, in this country, there's a lot of interest. Um, and, and frankly, most people are who try to lose weight uh, are not very successful at doing so. And, and so there's a lot of interest like, wow, this drug was such, or this class of drugs made such a big difference compared to really anything that came before it. Uh, I do want to just make everybody familiar with, I'm going to be mostly talking about semaglutide since that's the one we're using in our trial. And as I mentioned, semaglutide has more than one brand. So the first brand that was uh, a formulation that was approved was approved for diabetes in 2017, and that's Ozempic. And um, it's an injection. And then a couple of years later, there was actually an oral formulation, which is an interesting story in and of itself, because this is a peptide, but it actually was formulated um, with a special co-formulant that made it absorbable from the GI tract. And so again, for diabetes, but what really made everything take off was a couple of years later uh, when the Wagovi brand got 
approved. And I, again, want to emphasize these are all semaglutide formulations. And in fact, Ozempic and Wagovi are both even made by the same company. And um, they're just, mar they, they do get marketed differently and, and have different doses and different approvals, but they're the exact same drug. And so initially they were approved for weight loss. And then just a few months ago, this final indication for reducing cardiovascular um, events was also approved. So everybody got super excited in 2021 when, when the approval for weight loss happened. And there are now other drugs on the market as well for, for weight loss. And then now also for the, not only does it not harm folks with who have a history of cardiovascular issues, but it may actually be, it appears to actually be beneficial to them. And, and it's even approved now for that indication. So just to make sure everybody's on the same page, GLP-1 is one of several different what are called incretins, and there are these are hormones and they're peptides, and they get synthesized in the GI tract in response to food in there. So what you're seeing is here you have some food in the in the intestine, and then when that happens, then there are special cells in the intestine. It's different cells, so the the um, GIP, which is another incretin, gets synthesized by K cells, and GLP-1 gets synthesized by L cells. But in, in the case of diabetes, what we're most interested in is the peripheral effects, and particularly on the pancreas. So this is, we don't typically see a lot of, of low blood sugar with these drugs because their um, their release is glucose dependent. So it's not like giving somebody a shot of insulin where regardless of whether there's, there's any um, food present or any glucose present, um, that you get an equal response, the response is in response to food. The half-lives of these are very short, and I'll explain why in, uh, in just a minute, but you can see it's on the order of a few minutes. And then once they've been cleaved by this pep, um, peptidase, which is called DPP-4, they're no longer active. And so um, that's why you see on the second little arrow there with the X in it, the, the activity only lasts for a few minutes once secreted. So GLP-1 and GIP are not themselves really useful as drugs because they only last for a few minutes, essentially. And then after that, they get cleaved and they get excreted by the kidneys. So drug companies have, have been working very hard to try to solve that problem. Um, the reason why the half-life of GLP-1, and I'm going to focus just on GLP-1, I'm not going to talk about GIP anymore today. The reason why this happens is because, again, there's a, there is this peptidase. It's an enzyme that cleaves, particularly at this one spot between an alanine and a glutamate. And so we have drugs that block this peptide, uh, or sorry, this peptidase, and then we have these drugs that uh, that are similar to GLP-1, but have been modified so that they're not as easily cleaved by DPP-4. So one of the earliest in this class is called exenotide, and you can see for the exenotide, the, one of the amino acids here has been changed in, or substituted. Instead of an alanine, you now have a glycine there, and that makes it more resistant to being cleaved by DPP-4. One of the other things that the drug companies have done is make it where these drugs will bind to albumin in the blood. And again, it helps protect them. So if we look at some of the other popular drugs that are currently on the market, one is liraglutide, which I'm not going to talk about very much today. Uh, and then the other is semaglutide. So liraglutide, if you look, has that same alanine in it. So it's still susceptible to cleavage by DPP-4, but its half-life is still not just a few minutes. It's more like a day. And um, the reason why is because of this part. So this long fatty acid chain, which will help it bind to albumin. And so then if you look at the bottom, it's semaglutide, which has a half-life of about a week. And here you have two things. One is you have a substitution uh, of the amino acid there. So this is an amino isobutyric acid uh, that's been substituted for that alanine. So basically like a, like a methyl alanine. And then you have your uh, long fatty acid chain there at the bottom too, which again makes it easily um, or, or more amenably bind to albumin. So, so it has both of these factors going for it to help it um, stay in circulation longer. Okay, so I've already alluded to the fact that for diabetes, we primarily care about the peripheral effects of these drugs. And so we care about what happens with the liver, the pancreas, the muscles, and so forth, and all those, those kind of issues with, with um, that, that are affected by diabetes. But with the obesity side of things, there probably is some peripheral effect too, because these drugs do have some direct effects on the GI tract, so they affect um, they can they can slow down gastric motility, 
And uh, so there is that aspect of it, but it's actually probably mostly central, the, the mechanism of action for how they help obesity. And so what they're doing, and I'll talk very briefly about this in, in just a minute, but, but essentially what we think they're doing, the main mechanism that they're working for obesity and probably for addiction as well, is that they are actually going to the brain and affecting craving or um, just basically people's urge to consume, in this case, food, or in, in the case of our trial, alcohol. So this is a very simplified picture because I don't unfortunately have time to get into the reward circuits of the brain, which is a very interesting topic in and of itself if any if anybody's curious. But I on this slide, I have listed three of the main brain areas that are thought to be uh, or that are known to be very much um, affected in in patients that have substance use disorders or addictions. And so the ventral tegmental area and the nucleus accumbens in the prefrontal cortex in particular, these are all connected together. Uh, and they and they talk to one another, and they are the the parts of the brain that affect whether several things. One is there's the reward aspect of of using a drug, um, which is thought to be associated with with dopamine release. But there's also um, what's sometimes called hyperkatifia, where people who particularly once they have an addiction, if they stop using the drug, then then they they feel worse if they don't use it, and so so basically then people use to not feel bad. And then there is the prefrontal cortex, which is involved with executive function. And so these are the things that we think that GLP-1 receptor agonists like semaglutide could potentially affect. Okay, I'm not going to go through all these studies, but I am going to go through briefly a few of them. The main thing I want you to get from this slide, so and I've only listed eight of them here, but there's actually others is the fact that we have known for probably about a little over a decade now. Um, the first of these studies came out in 2013, and you can see the first one done by our group. So the ones that have little stars by them are the ones that our group did. So there's one that we published in, in 2015. And, uh, but we have known for quite a long time that, that GLP-1 and agonists, receptor agonists of GLP-1, and so all these other drugs that are mentioned here are, are GLP-1 receptor agonists, can affect the craving or the drinking of alcohol in mice. And so um, because of that, that is actually the scientific underpinnings and, and the reason why we're conducting these trials. So it's not because of Oprah and it's not because of somebody on TikTok. It's actually because 10 years ago, people were studying this and noticing these things in rodents. And so this is why it's become uh, a target. It just takes a while, of course, for, for everything to wend its way through the system here. Like I said, I do want to very briefly go over a couple of these trials. These are the ones that were done by our group. And so here's one. So this AC3174 is uh, not a market. It's a GLP-1 receptor agonist, but it's not on the market, which is why it doesn't have an actual name. It just has this acronym. But essentially this model, and, and all these are done in different models. So this rodent model is, they, these are mice that are dependent on alcohol. And so basically what they did is they took um, the, the very far left where it says zero, those mice were just getting what's called a vehicle. It doesn't have any drug in it. And so when that was done, you can see there, there was a lot more um, drinking that went on in, for the mice that, and, and the dark bars represent the mice that are alcohol dependent. They drank a lot more alcohol, unsurprisingly, than the mice that weren't. And you can see that for the other three columns there where they were getting um, injections of this AC3174, then they drank less. Um, so that's only true, though, in the in the mice that were alcohol dependent. Uh, and then what the group did is stop giving the drug and see what would happen, right? And see what happened to the drinking. And basically, after a week of washout, they didn't see uh, in, any difference. The mice, or or, or it still, the effect was not completely lost. The mice continued to drink less compared to if they just got vehicle, if they were the ethanol dependent mice. Again, not talking about the controls. Uh, and then when they tried again after a second week of washout, they basically found the effect wore off. So the reason why this is important in, is that unsurprisingly, these drugs are not, quote, cures for addiction. Uh, in the same way that people who have diabetes have to stay on medication for diabetes, people with obesity probably have to stay on the medication for the obesity too. Um, and so there's some thought that, you know, again, you can't probably just take this drug for a week or two and, and then um, be, quote, cured of, of the addiction. Okay, here's another study that was also done with rodents, in this case with rats, 
And this was, was done again by our group looking at both liraglutide and semaglutide. So both of these, as I mentioned, are on the market. And these are the ones that I had shown you before have those uh, those long fatty acid chains to help them bind to albumin. And so the, the interesting thing about both of these is that we the group found that at, they do decrease the intake of ethanol by these mice. And so the difference here is these are not the ones that are that are dependent. They don't have to drink and they actually are given the option of drinking water from one bottle or drinking alcohol from a different bottle. So so it's basically um, they have the ability then to select what they would like to drink. So what's interesting here is that again, they both did decrease the preference for for the alcohol, but the reason, and, and this gets to why we picked semaglutide. Um, part of it, I think, is also because the semaglutide lasts longer, but but part, but a big part of it is because the semaglutide seemed to work better. So um, it decreased the preference for, for ethanol more. And then not only that, it seemed to be more selective. So the liraglutide also decreased the water intake in this in this model, but the semaglutide didn't. So that's better. We don't want the mice to die of thirst, right? So they or the rats in this case. So or or humans if we're giving this to people for for um, addiction in humans. So so ideally you want them to drink less alcohol, but not drink less fluid altogether. Okay, here's one more study that was done. This is my favorite model. The name of it I think is great. Drinking in the dark, and this is. These mice are, are not dependent on alcohol either. This is actually a binge drinking model. So if you kind of imagine your, your college students drinking on weekends, but they can, they can go several days without drinking. And so what you see here with the semaglutide is um, they tried because, of course, um, mice also really like sweet. Uh, and so they tried both sweetened and unsweetened alcohol, and in both cases found, and you can see this is actually dose dependent as the dose of the semaglutide was, was increased, the mice drank less. And that was seen in both sexes. And then they actually tried the same thing with several other different um, solutions as well. So including just water. And here, this is different than what we saw in the uh, in the other study in the other model. Here, there was a decrease in water consumption. Uh, and then also these sweet solution, the the saccharins non caloric, and the other two do have calories. One of which is a is a carbohydrate, the maltodextrin, and one of which is fatty, which is the corn oil. So in every, so here we didn't get that selectivity. Okay, so that's all well and good, but most of us probably don't care too much about helping with addiction in rodents. So what about in primates? And there is a study that was done in monkeys here, these vervet monkeys, and this was using liraglutide, which as I mentioned, has a shorter half-life than semaglutide. So it was being injected every day as opposed to once a week. And so what you're seeing here, they injected it for 12 days and during that second week, they did actually see a decrease in the consumption of alcohol by these monkeys. And then when they stopped administering the liraglutide after 12 days, on the 13th day, they still saw a decrease in alcohol consumption. And then on the 14th day, uh, they actually saw an increase. So this was of concern, and, and I'll explain this when, when I talk about our, our trial design. We actually had some concern about a potential rebound drinking effect where people would stop taking the drug and then drink more than they were drinking even before, um, which fortunately is not something that we've been seeing so far. Okay, I do want to point out that there now are coming out several studies in humans, and again, this is a list of some of them, but not all of them. And these are all, however, not clinical trials. They are either retrospective cohort studies or large data sets. Uh, some of them are genetic association studies and imaging studies and so forth, but none of these are trials. So, um, and there's actually some interesting ones too toward the bottom that that have been looking on at people's posts on social media and seeing uh, and, and analyzing those to to try to get a sense of, uh, of of what's going on in humans. So these all do support the idea that again that GLP-1 receptor agonists are probably going to be, or or hopefully going to be useful in in treating addictions, including alcohol use disorder, but again, they're not randomized controlled trials. There actually is one randomized controlled trial. Uh, it was done with exenotide uh, and published a couple of years ago, and here you're seeing the results, and it was actually wah -wah, a negative trial. So basically, exenotide, like semaglutide, is dosed once a week, and they went, you can see as it going out all the way out to uh, really half a year, six months, if and they did not find that there was a significant difference here. Um, 
they did this subgroup analysis, though, that was of some interest and potentially for us and also influenced how we organized our trial and designed our trial. And what they found here is so these solid lines uh, are, are showing you for um, either normal weight or for um, obese patients over BMI 30 with who were getting the exenotide. And here they did actually see a difference. So, so in the patients with a BMI of over 30, they did find that the exenotide reduced the number of drink, heavy drinking days for those patients. So that basically influenced us to try to focus more on patients that have obesity and are heavier as opposed to patients that, that do not have obesity. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you now about our trial and our trial is actually two trials. So there's the one we're doing, uh, which is the STAR Baltimore trial. STAR stands for semaglutide therapy for alcohol reduction. And there is a sister trial that's going on uh, in Oklahoma with some of our colleagues. So the, the it's not a multi-center trial, but but they are harmonized trials, meaning that the, the protocols are similar. And I've put the, the numbers there in case anybody wants to look them up on clinicaltrials.gov. I'll show you how you can do that. Um, if you go to the clinicaltrials.gov site and you put in addiction and semaglutide, you can actually get a list. It's not just alcohol use disorder. There's other substance use disorders also being, being studied. Um, and so if you do that, you'll get a list of them. So here's ours, semaglutide therapy for alcohol reduction. And if you click on that, then it tells you about the study and that it's recruiting and, and, and so forth. Um, I do want to point out, this is a PISU talk, so we do not take children or adolescents under the age of 18, and none of the other trials, I was curious, actually, none of the other trials do either. So um, it's already off-label even for adults to be used for this purpose, and so for kids, you're really off-roading because there's really no data at all. And, and again, speaking specifically for addiction, it, it is approved for adolescents for, for diabetes and weight loss. Okay, so the trial itself, here's here's some of the, just the way it's set up. It is a randomized trial. And so I do have to warn candidates when they when they um, come to, or, or are looking to sign up for the trial that there's a 50-50 chance they might get placebo, but so basically a saltwater injection. Um, it is blinded, so I don't know what they're getting. They don't know what they're getting, placebo controlled. Um, they come once a week to the clinic for 20 weeks to get injections, and then there's also a seven week follow up period. And then we also give them all educational modules, which I'll talk more about. So this is how we do the screening, which is a little bit different, I think, than how most academic centers do it. Essentially, we have a, we have about um, 20, 20, 20, 25 active trials going on at NIDA IRP. And so if somebody comes to our facility to screen, they actually screen them for every single trial. Obviously, people don't qualify for every trial, but it starts with an online screening like this. Uh, and so if you click that and go in, it'll, um, you do have to be, again, uh, at least age 18 to be in any of our studies. And then um, it does give people an option if they want to continue online or if they would like to call. There's actually an 800 number, so patients can call and, and screen by phone that way as well. Okay, so if they do come in past the phoning screening and they come in, then here's, and, and specifically they're screening for this study, here are the things we're looking for. So they do have to have a diagnosis of alcohol use disorder, which is made according to the DSM-5. And this is different than how heavy they drink. Okay, so, so severity of alcohol use disorder is based on, there's 11 criteria for all addictions, including alcohol use disorder in the DSM. And so people have to meet, if they meet at least two of them, then they can be diagnosed with a substance, with that substance use disorder. If they meet four to five of them, then they would get diagnosed as moderate sub, uh, with alcohol use disorder or whatever other substance use disorder. And then six or more would be severe. So that's not, the, one of the criteria is not how heavily they drink. That's a completely separate thing. Um, most of these criteria, again, I don't have time to go through all this with you guys today, but it is actually primarily behaviorally based. So how 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 this is affecting their lives, essentially, the substance use disorder. Uh, and then the heavy drinking is a, still something we screen people based on, but it's done a, a differently. It's done by what's called a timeline follow back, and I will explain how that works. But essentially, we follow the and our sister institute, NIAAA, which is the National Institute on uh, alcohol abuse and alcoholism, and they define heavy drinking for women as um, greater than seven per week or 14 for men. 
and then we also want people to have some binge pattern as well, where they have to have at least four days out of the last four weeks. That for women, it's greater than three drinks or for men greater than four. And then the main things we exclude people for. So this study, I definitely have patients with more uh, severe comorbidities than in many of my other studies. We do not, uh, we do not take people if they're diabetic, full blown diabetic. They can be pre diabetic, and uh, and obviously if they're on other weight loss medications, then we wouldn't take them. They can have some some severe medical conditions as long as they're stable, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then they have to be able to perform the 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 study procedures. So. One of them is MRI, one of them is a virtual reality, and I'll show you guys what those look like. But let me show you what the timeline follow back looks like, because probably a lot of you have not ever seen that. So I actually, these are from real patients. This is a couple of them. So the way this works, again, it's 28 days, and it is anchored around specific uh, important days that stand out. Uh, and so people then, like for this person, it, you can see New Year's Day, New Year's Eve, Christmas, and um, and Hanukkah, I don't know if people drink more for Hanukkah, but those have been included. And you can see this patient has has a binge pattern in the sense that there are some days where she doesn't drink at all, and then there's some days where she drinks uh, more than three drinks. So it the computer will will sum this all up for us. So her average per day is greater than one, uh, and so at 1.7, and then. The bottom one criterion is the one that applies for women. So they have to great they, they don't do fractions of drinks. So greater than three is the same thing as greater than or equal to four. All right, here's what it looks like for for many of our patients. So we do have some that are binge drinkers, but we actually have many patients who drink heavily basically every single day. And interestingly enough, a lot of them uh, there we do have some who pretty much drink all day long every day. But we, I would say the majority of the folks we're getting in this in this category actually are folks who go to the go to work all day and don't drink and then come home and drink all night. And so here's an example of that. This gentleman, he uh, pretty much every day drinks about a, a, a 12 pack. And so you can see if you if you look through, um, there's the lowest he has on here is 10 and the highest is 16. He averages out to 12.6 and it's 28 out of 28 days. So, you know, really heavy drinking, but again, um, he basically only drinks in the evenings. Okay, so here is how the study is set up. And this is one of the reasons why I have to explain about the brand names because they, they are dosed differently and the schedules are a little bit different. Uh, so we follow the Wagovi schedule, which is the obesity formulation, and you can see it listed out here. So basically per the FDA and the manufacturer, if you, we follow the same schedule somebody would go on if they were getting this drug clinically. So the, the original month or to two months are subtherapeutic doses. And then, um, you, and you basically go up slowly over time. And this is primarily to prevent adverse events and people from getting sick. So uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the adverse events, like I said, towards the end, but you can see there's five different dosing levels. And so this is this picture at the bottom right is came from the Wagovi website and it's exactly how they explain it. And you can see um, really they consider the 1.7 milligram dose to be the maintenance dose for obesity. But actually we, we start seeing, we definitely see people losing weight at lower doses than that, particularly at the one milligram dose. And then on the left, I mentioned about these education modules. So everybody's getting these. So technically all of the patients are being treated, even the ones on placebo, because they're all getting these modules. Okay, so the pen, not only are the dosing of these different, but the pens are different. So remember, these are both injections and they, and they come as pens. So the Ozempic ones are shown on the left and you can see there's a little dial on them. And they are actually multi-use pens. So each Ozempic pen gets used for four weeks, and uh, you so you set you turn the little dial and you set it for the dose and you and you do your injection. And that's in contrast then to the Wagovi pens, which are single-use pens. And so you use so so for Wagovi you use four different pens in a four-week period. For Ozempic you use one pen for four weeks. There's some other differences too. The Ozempic pens have to be primed. Um, and so you might be wondering, well, why do we care? Like, why do we even care about the Ozempic pens? And the reason why is because, as I mentioned, this drug is very popular and there's actually a shortage. And so there's not enough Wagovi brand. And so we're actually using both brands. So how do we how do we deal with that, right? Because we want everybody to follow this, this Wagovi um, schedule, like I've shown you again here. So what happens is if they if they are getting Ozempic, uh, they still the the low 
dose ozempic pens still follow the same dosing regimen uh, for at the subtherapeutic level that the Wagovi pens do. So we can use the lower dose pens like that. And then um, there is a one milligram pen that you see there on the bottom on bottom left of that right hand picture. And so we can use that one too, but then there, the next pen up, there's no 1.7 milligram pen for Ozempic. So after we don't use the two milligram pens at that point, the person, if they are on the real drug, they have to be transitioned to Wagovi for the last two months. All right, so this is a phase one slash two trial, which means that we are interested in safety and early efficacy. And mainly what we're doing is following folks for adverse events. And we are also looking at, can people make it all the way out to the 2.4 milligrams? Um, and then also we do test people, actually every single week they do that timeline follow back. And we're looking at, at the, not just for alcohol, but, but we also ask them about other drugs they may be. So um, I'll talk about this more in a minute, but, um, in this state, cannabis is legal, and so we have quite a number of folks who use cannabis. We have folks that smoke cigarettes. I have a few folks that are using cocaine. Um, so we're, we're also interested in, in people's report and then also their food consumption. Uh, so we're interested in all those things. And then there are some other secondary outcomes too, and then including some of our study procedures, which are, uh, which are listed here. And so we do, we do a baseline for all these things. Uh, looking at their food craving, alcohol craving, and then also um, doing the imaging of their brain. So they end up with three MRI sessions. So the first one's done at the first visit, then there's before they get any drug, and then there's one done about halfway through and one done at the end. So this is what the virtual reality buffet is. And basically the person puts on a headset like you're seeing in these in these photos. And then th when they put this on, it's 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 almost like being in a cartoon. It doesn't look like like actually real, but you can see what all the food looks like and they're able to pick which food they want and how much they want. And so we're actually tracking which foods they pick, um, the caloric value of those foods, with the idea being that people's choices will differ based on uh, over time, based on whether they're on the real drug versus versus the placebo. And then we have a room here at NIDA that I call it the mock bar. And it is actually set up to look like a bar. So you're seeing a picture of it. That's an, the actual room on the left there. And so what we're doing here, this Q reactivity task, uh, you're seeing two of the runs. Uh, the, there's one with water, there's one with food, and then there's two with alcohol. So the, the girl on the right there, she's not actually drinking the water or the alcohol. Um, it's actually kind of mean. <laughs> Because these remember, these folks all have alcohol use disorder, and most of them it's pretty severe. Uh, it's severe alcohol use disorder, and they're mostly heavy drinkers too. But basically, they tell us ahead of time what their favorite drink is, and we go ahead and buy that. And we pour it into a glass and, and allow them to smell it, like you're seeing this girl doing on the right. Um, but we don't actually let them drink it. And then we have them fill out a questionnaire to tell us how bad they wish they could have a drink right now. So particularly for the first session when when they, you know, because most of them have not done it before unless they've done other studies with us. Um, I've had several, I, I would say it's a pretty universal reaction that at the end of this session, the patients tell me as soon as you guys let me out of here, I'm going to go home and drink. Uh, so some people have a really strong reaction to the mock bar, some of them less so, but but some of them do. All right, and then we do several tasks in the MRI as well. And so here you're seeing a task that's actually kind of analogous to what I was just showing you in the mock bar, where they're being shown now in this case, it's pictures of food and alcohol and, and other items that are not food or alcohol. And then again, uh, they're being asked to do different tasks while they're in the MRI. So this is not like a normal clinical MRI. It takes two to three hours to complete all these tasks and they're in the MRI that entire time. Uh, and so we do warn people, you know, occasionally we have people who can't tolerate it. Um, we try to screen them out, but it does happen still. And uh, and we do warn people. The other thing is I'm not gonna sedate them because we need them to be awake to do the tasks. Plus they all have alcohol use disorder, so I don't really wanna be giving them benzos if I can avoid it. So they don't get sedated. All right, so here uh, are the demographics of our patients so far. So as this is fresh as of a couple of days ago, we have uh, we we have 17 patients currently that we've enrolled so far, and I'm comparing our study to the other clinical trial that I mentioned that was published a couple of years ago with exenatide. So you can see for our demographics, uh, we have a little bit more 50-50 in terms of male and female breakdown, and then we have more younger patients uh, and more racial and ethnic diversity as well. Um, more importantly, probably from the aspect of 
what we think uh, the, the patient population that we think is most likely to benefit from the from these drugs, um, we do have a heavier BMI patient population compared so far. Uh, and, and as I said, we're deliberately trying to skew it that way. So, so they have to have a BMI of at least 25 to be in a study. Uh, and so it is skewing heavier. And so some of my folks, we, we can go all the way up to 50. Some of my folks are in the high 30s. So right now the 39.6 is the, is the highest BMI person we have. And as I mentioned, it's very common in, now in this state for, for folks to use cannabis. So quite a number of our patients do, which is different than in the Clausen study because they excluded the uh, people with other substance use disorders. And uh, most of our patients are also smokers, either current or former. And uh, most of them actually also have mental health comorbidities. And as I mentioned, I do have a couple people with significant medical comorbidities. So one of them has coronary artery disease and one of them has fatty liver disease. Okay, and then in terms of their drinking, so as I mentioned, uh, there's a difference in, in severity of alcohol use disorder versus heaviness of drinking. So um, most of our people do have severe alcohol use disorder, as I mentioned. And then if you look at the number, it's really hard actually to do these comparisons because the way we define a drink uh, in this country is as 14 grams of alcohol, which corresponds to one 12 ounce beer or five ounce glass of wine or uh, one and a half ounce shot. But that's not how they define it in Denmark and many other countries. So they define it as 12 grams. So I actually did the calculation and converted their um, their drinks into into ours. So, so far, at least our patients tend to be more heavy daily drinkers compared to the Danish patient population. But interestingly enough, theirs were more, were heavier bingers because if you look at um, the number of, of heavy drinking days, so they actually had more than, and, and again, they define it differently than we do in, in this country. But I tried to make it as equivalent as possible, but, but they do have, uh, they do appear to have more, more folks who have more heavy drinking days. And then um, what we, so that's what was what their outcome was, their primary outcome. Ours, remember, is this weekly alcohol drinking. And so um, that is defined differently than what I mentioned before. So for women, it has to be greater than 14 drinks per week, or for men, greater than 21 drinks per week. Uh, and again, most of the patients do fall into those categories. So the vast majority of them have both severe AUD and are heavy weekly drinkers. All right, so if you're wondering, which I think um, to me is one of the more interesting things about it, like wh what's been going on so far. So at this point, we have three folks who've completely finished the entire 27 week trial and all three of them did reach the 2.4 milligram dose. And then we have two more that have finished dosing that are currently being followed up. So they'll both finish next month. And then we have had four of them withdrawn. So two of them I withdrew for medical reasons in both cases because of bumps in their lipase. So one of them never even got dosed. Uh, he, this was really interesting. So he came a week before and his lipase was normal. It was 40. And then the day of his, con of his consent and enrollment, we rechecked it and it was over 400. So we decided not to dose him and, um, but he had already been randomized at that point. And then there are two patients that that chose to withdraw themselves, one for side effects, and she made it out to five weeks before withdrawing. And then we had another person who made it all the way out to 17 weeks and then uh, and then basically dropped out of the study, which I'm, I'm still not totally sure why. Um, we're, we're trying to, to get some feedback about that, but, but she was so close, so that was disappointing. Uh, and then the eight actively dosing patients, you can see the the divide here. So we have one per the the guy who's currently at 1.7. He just got his last dose of uh, at 1.7 yesterday, so he'll be going up, uh, or actually two days ago. So he'll be going up to the 2.4 starting next week. And you can see most of them are are at lower doses. All right. And then in terms of the adverse events, so things we've seen, it's primarily GI things, and most of them are not too severe. We had that one person who did have to drop out because the GI symptoms were, were too severe, but for the most part, most, most of them tolerate it pretty well. And if you're wondering what kind of GI symptoms, so here's, here's a list of things that people report sometimes. Um, it's basically GI distress. And patients, I, I think honestly, part of it is no, probably some pharmacological tolerance, but I think a lot of it is behavioral. People just learn what makes them feel sick and, and avoid it. And I tell the patients to do that. It's like, if you, 
if you notice that, you know, heavy, greasy, creamy foods make you feel sick, then don't eat those. And so within a few weeks, people by trial and error, people generally do figure it out. So um, usually can be controlled. And then other things people have reported. So fatigue definitely comes up sometimes. And then, of course, issues at the injection site where people have pain or bruising. Um, we did have one person have a panic attack in the MRI. We've had a few people report having vivid dreams. And then um, some people with headaches or dizziness. And the dizziness has mostly been because of kind of feeling a little disoriented with the virtual reality. And then um, the, as far as the actual addiction effects, so some people do, like I said, have a really strong reaction to the Q reactivity and the mock bar. Um, and the way the best way I can describe it is it's almost like watching someone have a panic attack, like even though nothing terrible is happening to them on the outside, they feel really horrible for several minutes until the feeling passes. And that's basically if somebody has a severe craving reaction to the Q reactivity, then, th then that's basically what happens to them. So we take them out of the room and let them rest and, and the feeling does pass after a few minutes. Uh, and then we do see universally everybody does decrease their food and alcohol and often other drugs too, consumption of them. And so I think part of it is probably because we have a little bit of a biased audience. If you think about who wants to be in this study, they're generally people who are interested in cutting down their drinking and or, and or losing some weight or both. So, um, so no surprise there. Plus, if you think about it, alcohol itself has calories. So if people do cut down their drinking, then just by doing, even if they're not dieting, just by doing that alone, um, they often will lose some weight. The good news is the things we haven't seen. So we haven't seen a lot of GI complications, which is fortunate. Um, so we were worried about pancreatitis. Like I said, we've seen some bumps. Um, we were worried about, could we get surgical complications, gastroparesis, nothing like that. Um, we have not seen people, there were some sporadic reports of weight loss where people get malnourished. We haven't seen that. Um, the people with chronic conditions, they haven't been worse. Uh, there's been some reports about potentially about depression and, and anxiety getting worse. And the EMA, which is the European version of the FDA, is still investigating it, but we're not seeing any evidence of it. And our FDA does not believe that that uh, it's associated or, or at least court, um, causal. And then so far, as I mentioned, we have not seen that rebound drinking increase after we stopped dosing people. But again, it's only been five patients who who've made it all the way through to the end so far. All right, I'm going to skip through some of this stuff because I want to make sure we have time for questions, but I do want to caution you, you this crowd, especially because you're, you're a bunch of toxicologists that um, not all semaglutide is the same. So besides all the different brands that I've shown you, there's also because of the shortage, there's a bunch of compounding pharmacies that have started making semaglutide as well. So the formulations are not always the same. Uh, often they make semaglutide salts. And then there's issues with dosing errors. And so I, it was really one of the pharmacists at our poison center here that explained to me why this happens, because here's what these folks get when they order this compounded semaglutide um, formulation. They get, they get insulin needles and this bottle like this, and then they have to try to figure this out, um, how, to, how to dose this. And so some of you might have seen this poster that they presented at NACCT last year, where they basically had a case series of folks who, who had these dosing errors. Uh, my favorite one's actually the third one, the NP, who um, basically <laughs> didn't believe the pharmacist's uh, calculation and, and so had a 10 time overdose. But the good news is nobody had any long-term severe effects. Basically, they, they had pretty bad GI distress for several days and then they could be treated conservatively with fluids and antiemetics and, and they all got better. So again, nothing super terrible happened to these guys acutely. All right, and then the last thing I just wanna, cause all this sounds great and amazing. So why don't we just going around and using this? So the last thing I, I wanna do is just caution everybody um, to have some humility. Uh, and, and that goes for me too, because you know we're enthusiastic. We feel like this should work. And, and we want it to work, but the problem is these still are unproven. And so our official, and this, this commentary was written by several uh, of the PIs of ongoing trials of semaglutide for alcohol use disorder. And ultimately everyone agrees about using, there, there, there are FDA approved treatments for alcohol use disorder. There's naltrexone uh, and acamprosate. And so the recommendation is until we know for sure that these will work, 
the, uh, that is the recommendation to use them. And you might be thinking, well, you know, what's the harm? Why, why worry? So the best example I can give you is you may remember four years ago when the COVID pandemic started, there was a lot of excitement and interest in hydroxychloroquine. And so there were these anecdotal studies coming out and preclinical studies, uh, like, like in vitro studies essentially coming out, suggesting that it would work for COVID. And so actually our FDA gave um, an, e an EUA here, uh, to uh, an authorization to do this EUA. And um, so people started using this off label to treat COVID, right? And so first then some studies started coming out that actually it didn't work. And then even worse, some studies started coming out that not only didn't it work, but it causes harm, right? We had all these people with dysrhythmias. And so then even worse then this paper that came out saying that may maybe showing it worked ended up getting retracted, which was a huge scandal. And ultimately, a few months after they first authorized it, the FDA revoked the EUA and, and said, no, don't do this. So what I'm trying to get at is, you know, this the brain is complex. The body is complex. I'm not going to go through this, but I'm putting this up here to show you none of this functions in isolation. When we start perturbing one part of the system, we perturb lots of different things and we just don't know what we don't know. So we think this is going to work and we hope it's going to work, but we don't actually know for sure. And um, that's basically my conclusion here too. So the fact that this is a completely unique mechanism compared to drugs like naltrexone and acamprosate, we hope it's going to work, uh, but uh, even if it does work, we still have to, we're, we're going to have to worry about what, how to help people get it and afford it, because that's a whole nother problem. Um, but again, just to, to put in a word of caution. So, like I said, I want to make sure there's time for questions and um, thank you all for attending and listening. So, thank you so much for that uh, fascinating presentation on all of this new and emerging um, work. Are there any questions? If so, please type them into the chat. We'll be sure to relay those here. If there is a more detailed question, just indicate that you would like to be unmuted at this time, and I can do that as well. Okay, yeah, and I'm going to, I think now I can see everything here in case people post. So the question um, okay, has so come in about opinion on GLP activate supplements or berberine. Oh, yeah. So supplements are always a tricky thing to discuss with patients because, and I'm sure you guys have all had this experience too, where people have this idea like, oh, it's natural and natural must be safe. And I try to explain to people. So first of all, there's a lot of really dangerous natural things that'll kill you. And um, the most, in fact, the most toxic things we know are natural <laughs> So, you know, botulinum toxin, natural, ricin, natural. So, um, so natural does not equal safe. And the other issue in all seriousness that, that you have to worry about is um, people often don't realize that supplements are not evaluated for efficacy and safety the way pharmaceuticals are. So, you know, the companies, and they're kind of, they have to be careful what they put on there and what they say, but they don't actually, um, they don't actually necessarily have clinical trial data and in most cases don't have it to prove that that the substances work so um and then they also don't necessarily have whatever the package says it necessarily put that into the package so there have been several studies done of, of supplements where when people test them they find that there's either pharmaceuticals in them or there's completely different uh, herbal things in them than than what the package says uh, so my advice to, to patients is, um, you know, be very, very cautious about it because, you know, again, the FDA will remove the these drugs from the market if they if somebody gets hurt or killed. But that's not, you know, going to help you if you're the one that's <laughs> that's that, that the report gets made on that causes them to remove the, the drug from the market. So um, my advice would be to not try those. For that reason. All right, so um, question that came in, are there studies using uh, terzepatide? Great question. And um, yeah, because that's like the natural mm -hmm. next thought, right? The next step. And there is not, to my knowledge, a, a clinical trial currently underway with, with terzepatide. There have been, so actually, if, um, if you go back to, to and, and I can make the slides available if people want, the, there, there's the one where I listed all the different um, 
human trials that are not actually clinical trials. One of the social media trials they did, uh, they looked on Reddit at people's posts for semaglutide and terzepatide. And so in that study, it, which is again, only suggestive, it's not an actual trial. Uh, they did note that people reported that they drank less with terzepatide if they were taking terzepatide, but that's based on what people posted on, on Reddit. All right. Um, question about the ethical considerations for carrying out this type of research when people have active substance use disorders. Um, that could be a very long answer, I suppose, but um, any quick comments that you may have about the, the IRB process for these types of uh, research projects? Yeah, and maybe if the person could um, be a little more specific about which ethical things they're concerned about. So there's lots of ethical implications, right? You know. Um, for, for sure, folks with substance use disorders are potentially a vulnerable population, um, and particularly if they are under the influence. So uh, we definitely would not consent somebody who, who was intoxicated, and that does present a problem sometimes. Like I said, most of our daily drinking folks, they, they tend to drink only at night, and so they typically can come um, and, and have a breathalyzer of zero in the morning when they, when they come to us. Um, but we do have some who pretty much drink from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to bed. And so for those folks, it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit hairier, you know, and, and they do because they're probably never living with a, with a breathalyzer or blood alcohol of zero. Um, so those have to be assessed on a case by case basis and, um, yeah, again, I, I'm not sure exa exactly which which question about ethics they were concerned about. If the, if the question was about what I was talking about with the mock bar. So, so the other, I guess the other thing um, that's really important to say is that, you know, I, one of the, we do screen people very thoroughly and carefully and, and extensively. And one of the things that happens before anybody ever shows up to enroll is that because I don't ever want people to feel like there's a bait and switch. And I tell people, you know, and I actually, it was funny because someone who overheard me doing this said it sounded like I was trying to talk the person out of enrolling in the study. And I'm like, but I want people to understand, like some of the thing, you know, this is not a spa vacation. Some of the things we're gonna do are not fun. You know, it is not fun to sit there like, you know, this in the MRI for three hours. It's loud. If any of you have ever had an MRI, then, then you know. Um, you're not sedated. You're being asked to do these tasks. Some of the patients also have chronic pain. So laying there for a few hours might be uncomfortable for them. Um, you know, they can take a break if they need to, but um, that's one thing I, meant, I mentioned before about the Q reactivity. Uh, you know, if somebody, we did have one person that, like I said, I did have to take him out of the mock bar because the reaction was very strong and we, and we let him kind of relax. We actually have, it's called a relaxation room. So he was sitting in that, in that comfortable chair and it's kind of low stimulus to just kind of let people, um, chill out a little bit. And, um, so he sat in there for a few minutes and we talked about it and, um, I, you know, I said to him, you don't have to do this again. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to torture people. He wanted to try again, actually, and uh, so we did, and and he actually was able to perform the procedure the second time. So I think part of it is for people to just know what to expect too. But um, yeah, again, if I didn't cover whatever the person was asking, it looks like the follow up chat confirmed you you addressed the issue. Um, so the next okay. question down was just to clarify um, why people for your study um, with diabetes are excluded. Yeah, so that's a um, that's an interesting and, and, and difficult situation, right? Because we're obviously not excluding people with um, with obesity. I would say the big the part of it is to just try to keep things as clean as possible because this is a scientific trial and it's meant to be a proof of concept. Um, so you know, the other problem, of course, is if somebody has diabetes, we don't want to take away if we don't want to put them on a placebo if they have diabetes and they need to be on medication that's probably the biggest reason honestly is that we don't want to take folks who who have full-blown diabetes and need to be on medication and put them potentially on a placebo um so because they would be stopping their other diabetes medication if they stayed on their diabetes medication it would actually interfere with our potentially with 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 our um, study drug. So that would, uh, so, so it's primarily for, for safety and also for, for scientific integrity would, would be the main reasons I would say. It's not gonna hurt them um, to be on semaglutide. I mean, people get semaglutide for diabetes all the time, right, clinically. And then possibly kind of a related uh, follow-up question um, from somebody else 
was for persons who are on placebos with chronic alcoholism, what other supports are in place for them to continue participating in the clinical trial? Yes, yeah, so in our trial, the main, everybody gets those modules, the educational modules. So technically, and it was interesting, when we first wrote the protocol, we said that there was no benefit in the protocol and the IRB actually made us change it because they felt that the take control modules were a treatment benefit to everybody. And so even the folks on placebo are getting some benefit. Uh, and we don't actually know for sure, again, that the semaglutide is gonna work. So, um, but everybody is technically getting some treatment. I should say, and I didn't specify this earlier, I should say we do not take people who are currently on treatment for, for alcohol use disorder. So if somebody is already on naltrexone or a campersate, or even things that are used off label to treat AUD. So, for example, sometimes some um, people might be on like topiramate or or some of these other kind of. We we would not put them in this trial. So I don't want to stop any. If if somebody's being actively, or if somebody says I want to be on an FDA approved medication, and we do offer to people. So if they want to be on an FDA uh, approved medication and be an actual bona fide approved treatment, because we warn people this, we don't know for sure if this is going to work. So, um, in that case, we would refer them to treatment. Right. I did not see anything else coming in right now. So, thank you so much for this fascinating uh, discussion. Yeah, thank you guys and great questions. Appreciate you guys.